Friends, the people of faith in the Old Testament times, they possessed a very real and a most personable relationship with their God. In the very first verse of our lesson from the Old Testament, the reader is able to perceive that the speaker is exhibiting a strong sense of frustration. See, you can still be a person of faith and be frustrated. For there, we see that the speaker, the writer, is frustrated that Jerusalem, the holy city, has been in exile for 150 years and that she had yet to be restored to her former glory. The words jump out at us. For Zion's sake, I will not be silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. Now, my friends, surely one can understand the sentiment of the prophet who has seen his people in agony as they were forced to sing songs of humiliation in a foreign land in exile. We can feel the pain of a people who were driven away from their homes and from their livelihood. Through the words of the prophet, we can see the struggle of a people who were forced to abandon their spiritual center, which was, of course, in Jerusalem. Yet, I must admit that I am intrigued by the way in which Isaiah's emotions were not necessarily directed at his captors, at the oppressors. His emotions were not addressed at the people. And you know, people can be tough on occasion. I know that doesn't happen here at Hamilton Square. <laughs> but there are times when people can not be tough along the way. But here in the midst of the words of the prophet Isaiah, we can see that the frustration, the prophet's impatience, the prophet's pain were all directed, at least in this particular passage, in a very real and powerful way towards Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. Isaiah was mad at God, or so it seems as we read the verses that are before us. You see, we may not be able to see this if we just read verse 1, but looking ahead at verses 6 and 7, we can see that this is definitely the intention of the author who writes, you who remind the Lord, you who get down and pray to God, take no rest, give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it renowned throughout the earth. Now, some may choose to say that some of these words come from a sense of disrespect and a lack of belief in one's God. I know that they're bold. They have to be bold. Because who would feel comfortable taking God to task for something that has not been done? We may feel frustrated with things in our life, but do we feel comfortable blaming it? it on God or saying, God, you have to come down right now and fix this. But the prophet, the prophet in these words has nothing but the highest respect for his God. He loves God more than anything else. So rather than to think that the prophet had an attitude of arrogance, Toward the Almighty, allow yourself to think about how this passage reflects the very nature of a very positive and a very healthy relationship between two parties. 
Now let me substantiate this by saying that the strongest and the most enduring relationships are those in which both parties are free to express their feelings. Not when one person feels up here and the other person feels down there, but when people feel free to express their feelings. Now, those of you who are in marriages, those of you who are in relationships, those of you who are, have friends, you will realize that this may not always be pretty to be in relationship with one another. But the results can be most effective, and I might add quite beautiful, when people are in communication and that honest kind of communication. Spouses who are free to be open with one another have a better chance of being together for a longer period of time in a healthy relationship. I had an aunt and uncle, and they argued throughout their 60 years of marriage. But they stayed married for 60 years. And they loved each other, and they had a number of children in the process, and grandchildren. Friends who express both their likes and dislikes have a strong sense of trust and respect between them. Thinking about how you are here at Hamilton Square Church, I have seen committees working. I have seen the session work for the better part of a half a year. And one of the reasons that you have been effective is that you communicate openly with each other. Not that everybody agrees with everything that is said, <laughs> but it's important to indeed speak the truth in love. You see, Isaiah had that kind of open relationship with his God. Now, he knew who was definitely in charge. Isaiah knew that God was God and that God was all-powerful, and he knew that God was the only one who could restore Jerusalem to her former glory, as God was her glory. Now, as the prophet was crying out to God, we should properly understand that Isaiah was not so much complaining as he was beseeching. He was praying. He was praying that God would bring deliverance to the faithful people of the promised covenant. And in the vivid imagery of his poem, the prophet is joined in his prayer by sentinels, by watchers who had been posted theoretically upon the walls of Jerusalem, raising their voices all day and all night, constantly crying out to God, please give us justice. Can't you see what's going on? Now, in ancient days, it was the usual business of sentinels placed upon the walls of fortified cities to sound an alarm when an enemy was coming. You know, this is the day before we had cell phones. <laughs> this was before we had all kind of this electronic communication and digital operations. So sentinels is what you had. And these sentinels were there upon the walls to communicate to the people. But in Isaiah's case, they were communicating to God. They are apparently angelic visitors who stand upon the walls of the ruined city and take up the prophet's supplication. They were not being silent. They were not resting until the Lord had delivered a complete restoration of the city. Now, as we talked about with the young people, this weekend, the nation paused to remember a man who refused to keep silent, a man who saw little rest as he beseeched his God and his country for justice. Knowing that we are not going to be going out to many celebrations for Martin Luther King tomorrow because it's supposed to be an icy mess. And even if it's not ice, I think, what's the high supposed to be, like 10 degrees? 
I'm putting on my sweatpants and staying nice and warm inside. So I figure if you indulge me just to, just to, to dabble a bit today on the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. One can be sure that he spent countless hours upon his knees asking God to deliver and oppress people from the anguish that had threatened their very existence and dignity. And like the workers for justice who had gone before and those who have come after him, it was necessary that their voices be constant, be constant, almost to such an extent that it became an annoyance to those who had to listen. There are times when we return on our television sets, yes, I'm of an age I remember, and you would see march after march, hear voice after voice. And we say, here we go again. Perhaps the best illustration of the spirit of not resting, of not being silent in Dr. King can be found in his work in Birmingham, Alabama, during a of 1963, which was, by the way, the centennial year for the Emancipation Proclamation, during which the slaves were theoretically set free by the proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. King selected Birmingham for this particular nonviolent protest because he and many others regarded that city of Birmingham as an impregnable fortress of bigotry, King's words. He felt that if Birmingham could be cracked, the direction of the entire nonviolent movement in the South could take a significant turn. For leading a march on what was Good Friday of that year, King was in prison. Yet the events of that particular week had been most effective in that they got the attention of who? The president. Who was the president in 1963? John Kennedy. Who was the attorney general? Robert Kennedy. They were paying attention. Then there occurred an incident that was most unexpected because there were eight leading clergy persons in that city. They were all Caucasian and they covered a gamut, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, yes, some were Presbyterian, look out. <laughs> they denounced King as an outside agitator, an interloper. They urged the African-American community of that city whom they called our own black community, to withdraw support from this unwise and untimely demonstration. This tactic backfired on these clergy, and it proved to be a boom to the campaign as it provided the form of King's memorable letter from a Birmingham jail. A portion reads as follows. I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. And just as the eighth century prophets left their little villages and carried their, thus says the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the apostle Paul left his little village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and city of the Greco-Roman world, I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own particular hometown. Like Paul, I must respond to the Macedonian call for aid. End the quote. Now King must have spent hours on his knees in prayer, some even in that jail cell. He, like the prophets of old who had gone before him, realized that the phrase, no silence, no rest, it reflects an attitude of our prayer life with God, but it also was indicative of a call to action. You see, my friends, it is one thing to say to a person in need, I feel your pain. I will pray for you. 
Ah, how easy it is to say those two things. It's a completely thing altogether, quite different. To take the next step by affirming, I feel your pain and I am with you. Yes, I will pray with you and I will be with you in the struggle. Like I wanted to make sure as I told those young people in that civil rights struggle and the civil rights struggle of every generation, it's important for there to be a wide swath of humanity that is speaking truth. And not just people of color were there, but indeed there were people who were Caucasian, international community, women and men. Be with you in the struggle to take this step as to heed the call of the prophet to go with God, to go through, to go through the gates of Jerusalem, to prepare the way for the people, to build up, to build up the highway and declare it of all obstacles. It sounds like that language that we had of John the Baptist makes straight the weight of the Lord. You have to make straight the weight of the Lord. The Lord's path is coming through. My friends, the Lord who has been beseeched will respond. That's the message we find there in that Lucan passage. We will keep on praying, keep on praying. God will listen, God will hear, and salvation will reach us as we act in faith. And we shall be collectively called the holy people. The redeemed of the Lord, as it says in the 12th verse of our Old Testament lesson. Because some of us may be tempted to think that the struggle for human rights, that this was a thing of the past, <sighs> of the 50s, the 60s, and 70s. But friends, let us recall another of King's quotations, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So where are those pockets of injustice nowadays? Where are those places where people are so filled with hate that they are, have difficulty seeing the importance of love? Where are those places where we need to indeed be involved as women and men who follow the gospel of Christ. We see there are still pockets of injustice where in places such as Syria. You know there's a Christian community in Syria and they wonder why the Christians all throughout the world do not see their plight. We can see injustice in places such as Saudi Arabia. Ah, oh, but that's easy to look way over there. How about right here? How about places of injustice as people are indeed trying to figure things out in Washington, D.C.? How about places of injustice on the border? Maybe even as close as Trenton, maybe even here in Hamilton. Friends, we are to be a holy people, one gather community redeemed by the Lord. May we have the faith, the courage, and the love to keep our voices at the forefront, to not to be silent and to not rest until we see the end of the forces of injustice which surround us. All praise. All glory all be to our God, who loved us enough to send the Son. Amen. amen. And amen.